I first met Robin Amis through Gnosis magazine, where we both were invited to write articles for their issue on Gurdjieff. It was through Robin's research that I discovered the direct links between Gurdjieff, the Fourth Way teachings, and ancient Orthodox spirituality, in particular instruction to monks. Robin had been going to Mount Athos for some time and was in fact considered a co-worker among the monks. His spiritual father was Paisius, the Saint Paisius of Mount Athos, who said to him, you English have served Western man very well with your intellect, giving him many things he needs, the solutions of many problems that have made life easier for everyone. Now you should do another work to understand and tell the world of the inner truth, the truth of the heart as well. Robin wrote a significant work entitled A Different Christianity, Early Christian Esotericism and Modern Thought. He published as founder of Praxis Press Institute, The Heart of Salvation, The Life and Teachings of Russia's Saint Theophan the Recluse, Views from Mount Athos, and Holy Hezekiah, The Stillness That Knows God, on the writings of St. Gregory Palamas, and the trilogy Gnosis by Boris Muraviev, an extraordinary third man to the gurdjieff Uspensky connection made known through In Search of the Miraculous and the Fourth Way System of Thought on Inner Transformation. These are powerful teachings which Robin has helped us anchor in their origins and therefore expand what the fourth way has been to a secular culture as a means of inner awareness and shift of consciousness into its true context which is the path of theosis return to God, awakening to God consciousness. For this, we owe Robin a tremendous debt of gratitude. Like others on this path, caught in the no man's land between Christianity and esotericism, he had the courage to travel alone, to think for himself, to risk rising up out of the box of these different teachings in order to find their union, their connection. In this audio recording, which I share with you, recently made available, waiting since the early 90s, on a cassette tape given to a friend seeking answers, we find Robin returning to us in this time to offer us these precious seeds of insight, enabling us now in our turn, this generation, this time, this future, making it possible for those who seek to understand what the heart of Christian mystical spiritual teaching is, its authentic means of inner transformation into the new creation, into the new person, into the maturity in Christ, which is the very essence of the good news, the revelation that this is possible for us to reach these higher spheres where something of the divine comes through us and blesses the world. Here now is Robin Amos speaking to us on the inner tradition of the ancient Christian world. Our legacy, our hope for the future. 
the Eastern Church has always had an unwritten tradition. This is to say that there has always, throughout the history of that church, been an intentional preservation and handing on of verbal information on how to interpret the written information. Callistos Ware refers to such a tradition in relation to litur liturgy and the function of the priesthood. In addition, there is a tradition of the life of Christ and of how the biblical reports should be understood, which has come down to the present day and which, for example, emphasizes the fact that the resurrection happened and in effect passes on the statement that the resurrection was such an improbable event that it was necessary to tell future generations that yes, this is not purely a symbolic statement but a statement of fact, as well as a major clue to the meaning of Christianity, since in this one event was the proof of the promise. Implied in Moraviev's statements, as in other sources, back as far as Clement of Alexandria, and of course in the biblical statements about teaching in parables to those without, is a tradition of inner meanings in a different sense of the word inner. This refers to a tradition of teachings and practices relating to the human inner world, which in contemporary terms is known as subjective. A tradition which begins in effect by saying that if you rid your perceptions of what occurs within you of all judgment or evaluation and simply perceive then the element of bias or distortion that is the constant danger of subjective knowledge simply disappears. The inner tradition which approaches things in this way also provides ways of becoming progressively more objective about the so-called subjective world. But it does say that this is not easy and it leaves as its only proof the hard to find evidence that certain individuals have acquired this objectivity and occasionally reveal it. This is in fact difficult to believe until one has begun to eliminate the subjectivity of one's own judgments, the personal bias of one's own view of oneself and the world. However, there is little doubt that there is such a tradition of inner knowledge in the sense of knowledge relating to man's inner experience of the world. In particular, there is a traceable tradition of this inner knowledge in the Eastern Church, which can probably, properly be claimed to be a Christian equivalent of something like yoga. This tradition is clearly present in both the Gospels and the teachings of Paul. It takes particular form in the School of Alexandria as manifested by the writings of Clement of Alexandria, then disappears from the surface of Christian life. However, it survives in the church to this day in places like Mount Athos where oral teachings underlie the external forms of the monasticism. And those teachings have a large inner content Secondly, it survives in 
the teachings of a particular stream of early fathers of the church, particularly the Cappadocian fathers, Gregory of Nyssa and his associates. I know from my own investigations after 16 visits to Mount Athos that the royal way survives there as an oral tradition. The most recent emergence of the inner tradition was in Russia with Paisius Velikchovsky, who, finding that the Russian monasticism of which he was part did not know what it was doing and what its purposes were, went on a long search which took him to Mount Athos, found Athos itself in decay, found the knowledge which Athos had lost and restored the inner life to Athos, then returned to first to Moldavia, restored the monasticism of Moldavia, and then to Russia, where he re-established the inner tradition. And because the clergy were not supporting it, as he considered adequately, established the tradition of Stazi, or elders, to guide those seeking the tradition, and then edited and published the Philokalia, which is the collection of the teachings of the early fathers, which is the mainstream of Mount Athos teachings. More recently, in the 19th century, Theophan the Recluse taught mostly by correspondence, a tradition of inner knowledge which clearly touches on the same ideas both as Gregory of Nyssa and Clement of Alexandria in their time and more lately in more narrow and idiosyncratic form by Gurdjieff Uspensky and their associates. The evidence for this is, I think, clear if one studies Theophan's work. And I have tried to make it visible in our rendering of his life and teachings. But the documentation of this material is still going on. And there are, of course, problems. In spite of the complaints of one scholar, who complained of statements made without documentary evidence. The evidence for an unwritten tradition must, of course, be unwritten, and its investigation must touch more on the anthropological methods of Malinowski than the methods of exegesis developed by the Protestant Church. You ask about the historical significance of Christ and the answer was that the historical significance of Christ relates to the breakthrough of the inner life into history in a new and more effective way as was demonstrated by the Christian martyrdoms as well as by the resurrection itself. This links with the idea of Oregon that the major teachings of the gospel have both inner and outer meanings. And the idea implicit in the inner tradition that to understand the inner and outer meanings of certain doctrines together is in itself a form of objectivity. The objectivity of the inner tradition to use a word which is subject to confusion, has to do with a certainty which comes when our own understanding is allied with the moment's inspiration in the 
literal meaning of that word inspiration. The inner tradition teaches that the final confirmation and the depth of understanding comes in a series of personal revelations which in their descriptions link up surprisingly well with Plato's statement in his seventh letter. The inner tradition then is a discipline as physics or chemistry is a discipline but confirmed not by external empirical evidence but by inner revelation.